probably hear from Jasmine who now has really got her work cut out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> After this history of the vicissitudes. I joined the, the dynasty of criminals. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then I think if you could remember any questions you had for Robert or comments, uh, we'll take them at the end. Okay. okay. Um, well, I'd like to, to thank um, Wenxin and Marina and, and Celeste for, for organising this workshop and, and Robert for agreeing to take part. It really is extraordinary to, to be doing a workshop on the nights in the presence of three people in Wenxin, Marina and Robert who've thought very deeply about this text, more deeply than almost anyone, and written or produced essential books on the subject. Um, I've just brought Robert's Companion to the Nights, which, if you don't know it, is delightful and um, fascinating and has become a kind of magic object to me. I've read it a few times and every time it seems to have new information as if it had secret compartments. It's, um, it's a really useful introduction to the text. Um, I should say that I'm at what feels like the very beginning of my encounter with, with this work. Um, I was commissioned, I did not choose this project, I was commissioned to produce a new translation of the Nights a couple of years ago. Um, I had been translating Arabic and French, mainly poetry, some prose, both contemporary and classical, for a little while, but mainly for myself. I was um, doing graduate work in Ottoman history, so I'm not, I don't have a background of academic expertise on this text, and it has really been a process of learning on the job. Um, and I've this, I want to emphasize that this is very much a workshop and, and the translations I'll be showing today are drafts. Um, they will probably go through another draft and will be edited and will probably change again. Um, so I would be very grateful for your insights, what you feel works, though I'm sure it's full of mistakes as well. Um, so we can talk about it, but these are works in progress. Um, would you like me <clears throat> to talk a bit more about... Um, 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 sort of like, yes, I mean, like you've heard Robert, and I'm sure you have read some of the translations, mm. but not all of them. Mm. Uh, and you've also, I've noticed that, you know, you, you know you're working with Mahsin Mahdi's text yeah. rather than Bulaq. Mm. And, yeah. and mm. of course, in some cases, you will have to work with Bulaq text, yeah. and maybe Kalkapta or Kalkapta true text. Right, so can you sort of like, Tell us a little bit more about your responses to the various translations mm. that you have worked with and why do you feel that you know there is a need for a new translation or a good question better? yeah and the other thing is you know the arabic text how mm. you respond to them and your choices of these texts to work with mm. and I, I suppose that for most of us and i can see most of us are women here and we, we sort of like you know, it would be sort of like great if you can t tell us about women's voice as well. Mm -hmm. I know there's a, a little bit, like a lot of it that you'll speak about at the public event, mm -hmm. but for now, like, you know, how do you weave into it and your voice into your translation, but also bring out the sort of like, how would you say, <coughs> uh, embedded voices, mm -hmm. right? That wrapped up in male, male voice or other voices. Literally embedded. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. I think can we just add something, which is that Galan left out the poetry. Um, yes. that, and that is, and in a sense, many of the receptions in mm. translation, I mean, not, not the standard translations, but the way the book is disseminated, mm. leaves out the poetry. Mm. But the poetry actually plays rather a strong function mm. in the narrative, so that in your yes. perfect choice, because you're a translation from poetry as well. So if you could just mention that. Yes. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult and daunting task for many reasons. It's a classic of world literature, it's daunting for that reason alone, but it's a, as, as Robert um, pointed out, it's a uniquely difficult text to know how to approach, let alone to translate. It's um, very unstable um, and has been, it, each story exists in many different versions. So just on, a, on the most basic level, um, the question of which text are we translating, which stories are part of this work is itself an unresolved question and one that involves many, many decisions. Um, I'm fortunate to be working with an editor who is Paolo Horta, who has thought about these questions and who has been guiding me. I'm also lucky in that um, 
while I'm under contract to produce a complete nights at some point in the future, um, what we are working on at the moment is a kind of intermediate book, which is a selection of stories, um, small selection of stories from French, the so-called orphan tales, and also um, the most popular tales from Arabic, a, a selection of those. So we're starting at the, at the shallow end. Um, so many of these decisions haven't actually been made yet, and this will be an ongoing conversation, which edition we work from, um, editions, I should say, because I think, I think we all agree that in the case of this work, it, it doesn't, it's, it's not necessarily the, the only approach to simply choose one uh, edition and, and say, well, this is the authoritative one, or this is the, the best one because it's the largest or because it's the earliest. Each story really has to be considered um, on its own terms and with its own history and, and, and textual networks. Um, some, some stories which appear in later collections might be copies of, of earlier versions of that story and are therefore tell us something about the, the origins of, those, of that story. And it's really a text that has a kind of archaeology. You can think of it almost geologically. It's, it's been built up by layers. There is a very ancient core of stories which probably comes from, um, it, it, which is probably itself a translation of a, of a Persian, earlier text in Persian. Um, and then over the centuries, layers have been added to that, to that core. And so to give a sense of that chronological texture, I think it's important to um, not simply to choose one, one edition, which may have been compiled in 15th century Syria or 18th century Egypt, and, and simply translate that as a kind of snapshot at that moment, but to give a, a sense of that process of accumulation, um, which is, of course, very difficult to do, and I don't know if we'll manage to give a sense of that texture. Um, but I think, I think we are agreed on, on that principle, that we will proceed story by story and, and try and, and find... What is, what is the version of this story that we feel is um, worth continuing to tell, which is a slightly different question from which is the most authentic or the, most, or the earliest. Um, another, another difficulty in, in translating the Knights beyond that very general level is on the level of the text itself, that it has, um, it's not very difficult language, compared to um, the Arabic prose and poetry that was being written before and after and alongside it, it's not very highly worked and indeed was not considered high literature um, in its own time and, and really until the point of that, the European encounter and Galland's translation, uh, I don't think it would have been included um, among, among the great works of Arabic literature. Um, it, it's written in what we call Middle Arabic, with moments of um, a more spoken rhythm. There are moments where it, where it seems to slip into a kind of vernacular. Um, and the question is how to translate that. Uh, Robert alluded to a kind of modern taste for um, an ideal of transparency in translation. Um, though, of course, that's, that's a debate that is still live in, in translation studies, how much to preserve of the foreignness or the pastness of a text and how much to... Um, assimilate it into a more modern idiom. Um, what I pick up in the text is a kind of simplicity, not a poverty, but a kind of um, earthy poetry and a, and a, and a very rhythmic quality. Um, and, and a poetry, quite apart from the moments when the prose does break into verse, as Marina said, there are moments of poetry um, often to, to linger on a point of emotional climax, a bit like in an opera, there's a, an aria where you pause to, to, to linger on that moment. Um, but the prose itself has its own <coughs> poetics, and I think this is true of, of all good prose, that it, it, they're not, um, I don't consider them very different exercises, translating poetry and prose, um, that to translate a, a, a text that is a good piece of writing is to be attentive to um, all of the effects that that text is, is trying to produce. Um, musical effects as, as well as um, obviously everything going on in, in, on the level of, of sense. Um, and to try and create similar effects in, in English. 
so almost to read it as a musical score as well as uh, as a containing information. <coughs> um, the, the story I'll be presenting today, the three, the porter and the three ladies of Baghdad, um, is a kind of microcosm of the nights. It contains um, many, many of the central themes, and also on the level of the language is, is an interesting text to look at because it contains poetry and prose. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a text that becomes progressively stranger. And you'll see, we'll read the beginning, which is um, almost a piece of social history. It's, it's set in Baghdad, and it's a, a description of material life in Baghdad. It's a shopping expedition, um, and things seem to begin very normally. And then there's a moment of, of, of strangeness, discordance, um, when the discovery is made that these three women live alone without a man. That's the first strangeness. And then things get stranger from there with the arrival of, of various new characters and the stories that they tell. Um, so it's, it seems to, to make that journey from um, one, one, one pole in the nights, which is um, the, the social history and the, the real material life that it contains, all the way through to um, the more fantastic elements. Um, sh we, we could move on to that story now, if you'd like. You will see in a moment um, that I've made a particular formal decision um, which, which arises from the conceit, which is that this is a woman telling stories um, over the course of an hour or a bit longer than an hour every night, um, and, and that there are tremendously high stakes that she is speaking to save herself. And I wanted to find a form that took seriously that idea, that there is something at stake, um, that there has to be a, an urgency um, and, and a kind of breathlessness to the, to the telling. Um, that she has to fill this time, she has to get to the end of the night, she can't stumble, she can't stop. Um, so even though this is a, a fictional conceit, it, it requires, or at least um, it seemed to me that there was room for a translation that attempted to, um, to, f to find a form for that. Um, so, so what I've done is, is translate each night as a single sentence. Um, because you know this is a sentence that is endlessly deferred her own her own death sentence um, this is uh, a kind of f flow of language um, <coughs> that is that can't be interrupted um, it would be fatal if if she were to to, to stop um, and what i found having made that decision what i found getting back into the same sentence every morning you know working on one sentence for six months um, is that it does become like a river. You slip into it and then you have to keep going. And it's in a, in a funny way easier to read and, and it moves more quickly, more swiftly um, in this way. I mean, you will tell me, this is, this is my impression, but that if you're always stopping and starting, there's always a point where you can put it down um, or take a break. But if, it's, if there's always more to come, um, it acts like a kind of hook or like a spell that you're caught, caught in it. Um, and so, you know, there is a question about whether that's possible, whether that works as a text, um, whether readers can bear it. Um, so we've, you know, I've tried to use spacing and, and commas and to give the eye some relief and, um, and also the breath, you know, when you're reading it, to, for there to be natural pauses. Um, but the idea is that finality is always deferred. And, and, and what happens also when you stop working on the level of the sentence, you know, when you write an English sentence, you're always, you're entering into a tradition of people who have written English sentences. And so you, without being conscious of these decisions, you are inevitably, you know, you'll be writing a sentence that is more Henry Jamesian or more Hemingway-esque. You know, you'll be making formal decisions that mean that your sentences belong to certain traditions within the English tradition. But if you stop working on the level of the sentence and you instead work with 
um, rhythm and, and um, you, you move into a different sort of tradition which is closer to song or, or scripture um, or incantation. Um, so it seemed to allow for a different kind of, um, for, for precisely this kind of loosely poetic prose that I feel is peculiar to the Knights, um, which I found difficult to, to, to capture in, in sentences. Um, but it came much more easily um, this way. Um, this kind of you know, poetic prose that we talk about a lot in Arabic, this kind of elusive thing, um, which some people just don't attempt at all because it is so particular and can, um, can come off so badly in, in English when you try and just insert moments of rhyme in, into the prose. Um, but it seems to me that English has all kinds of resources for creating uh, rhythm and, and alliteration and without, without being quite so thudding mm -hmm. <laughs> um, as, as just using rhyme. Um, so I've, I've brought <clears throat> just the beginning of uh, the story of the porter and the three ladies, um, which is... I, I love this story. I, found it, I find it really fascinating. Um, Marina actually has a, a, a copy of a book that we were just talking about earlier, by, by someone called Sandra Nadaf, who wrote a beautiful book called Arabesque, um, which has a, a brilliant discussion of this story. Um, and she says that it's about the, the, the porter on the one hand and the women, the three women on the other represent two worlds, that there's a kind of male um, realistic world and that the story moves progressively towards um, a, a female metaphoric world uh, in which language and sexuality are connected um, and this this is a theme in the nights and I think particularly in this story mysterious knowledge um, being connected to language being connected to female sexuality um, and, and there's, there's a point where that connection is drawn explicitly in this passage um, but what I could do is is read it with that with that um, or, or shall we hear it in Arabic first would, would, both. Yeah. Would someone would someone like to read the Arabic? Wafa, please do. Okay. ayyuha al-malik al-sa'id anna insanan min madinat Baghdad wa kana 'aziban wa san'atuhu hammaman fahuwa fi ba'd al-ayyam waqifan fi suqih muttakiyan 'ala qafasihi if waqafat 'alayhi imra'a ملتف في إزار موصلي مشعل بحرير بعصبه قلعي قلعية يخف ذرخون بشريط لاعب بسرموجة بعرق لاعب It's basically woven <تصفيق> فوقفت وقفت عليه وشالت شعيتها بأن من تحتها عنود سود بهدب أشفان طوال مدينة ناعمة الأطراف كاملة الأوصاف كما قال فيها بعض واصفيها وقالت له بكلام لين وعذوبة منطق يا حمال خذ قفصك والحقني Here we go. The story goes, my happy king, that there lived in Baghdad a man, never married, who worked as a porter, and as he stood in the market one day, propped on his basket, a woman appeared before him, wrapped in a cloak of Mosul silk, her head in a cloth the color of tin and scarlet boots at her feet, rainbow laces up her legs and toes in rainbow trim, and under her veil, when she lifted it, were black eyes, hooded and fringed with black, shapes to make a poet sing, and with sweetness in her voice, she said, take your basket and come this way. And the porter, hardly believing his ears, shouldered his basket in haste. Oh, happy day, he thought, O oh, day of grace, and followed her to the door of a house where she knocked. And to the man who came down, a Christian, she gave a coin in return for an olive jug of wine, which she set in the basket and said, this way. O oh, day of gifts, said the porter, day of blessings, day of bliss, and he followed her, basket high, until she stopped at the stall of fresh fruit, 
where she bought pale apples and musk apples, peaches and jasmine, Ottoman quinces and Damascus lilies, cucumbers fine as reeds, lemons from the coast and citrons from the sultan, myrtle and basil and henna blossom, daffodils and chamomile, anemones and violets and pomegranate flowers, laid it all in the porter's basket and said, this way. And he trailed her to the butcher's, where she stopped and said, cut me 10 pounds of meat and paid him its price. And he gave it to her with a little charcoal and she slipped it into the basket and said, this way. And the porter in a daze followed her onto the grocer's where she found all she needed to season and sweeten her food. Olives pitted and salted, white cheese and Syrian cheese, pickles sour and sweet and tarragon arranged it all in the basket and said, this way and on to the dry grocers where she bought shelled pistachios, almonds and walnuts, sugarcane from Iraq, fruit leather from Baalbek, roasted chickpeas and all the seeds, and laid the lot in the basket and said, this way. And he obeyed until they came to the confectioners where she piled a platter high with every sweet in the shop, honey lattices and almond rings, dumplings filled with cream and spiced with musk, soap cakes, anemone floss, pudding and fritters, amber combs and lady fingers, widow's bread, eaten thanks, judge's bites, pipes of plenty, broth of wind and delicacies of every description and lowered it all into the basket. Had you told me, said the porter, I would have brought a mule. But the woman only smiled. Then she was at the druggist's where she bought 10 bottles of scented water, lily, rose and others and two loaves of sugar, a lump of frankincense, <coughs> aloes wood, ambergris and musk, and candles of Alexandrian wax, and filled the basket with her spoils and said, this way. So the porter followed her. Shall I read on? Yes, lovely. Yes. The basket on his shoulder, until she came to a tall house fronted by a wide court with a double door of ebony inlaid with plates of gold where the woman stopped and gave a soft knock. But morning gained on Shahrazad and cut her speaking short. The strangest story, said her sister. If I live another night, she said, I shall tell you stranger. And when night fell again, her sister said, if you are not asleep, tell us a tale to break the waking night. And Shahrazad agreed. The story goes, she said, that as the porter stood behind the woman at, her, at the door, thinking of little but her charm, the polish of her language and the magic in her face, the doors flew open and, he bent to look, there stood a girl, five feet of symmetry and grace, a forehead like the sickle moon's blaze, eyes like the eyes of the doe and gazelle, brows like the crescent of Shaban, red anemones for cheeks, a mouth like Solomon's seal, lips red as native gold, teeth like a line of pearls, a neck like something given to a king, a fountain of a chest, pomegranate breasts, and a navel in whose dimple you could sit a drop of balm, and below was the hint of a rabbit without ears. And at the sight of her, the porter nearly lost his mind, his head its hall, and he thought never in my life was there such a blessed day. And at the keeper's welcome, the porter followed the buyer inside and into a large hall of elegant design with carvings and compartments, galleries and balconies, niches and benches, booths and closets with curtains drawn before them. And in the middle was a pool of water from which a fountain rose. And at the far end stood a bed of cypress wood and amber set with gems and hung with a net of red silk fixed with pearls the size of hazelnuts and larger. And behind the net, when it parted, was a woman with glamour about her, the philosopher's grace and the full moon's glow, Babylonian eyes and brows taut as bows, Aleph's poise and amber scent and sugar lips, a face to shame the sun, a girl like a galaxy or a dome of golden filigree or a bride in her finery or the glitter of tiles on the floor of a pool or the glisten of tail in a bowl of soup. And she rose, this third woman, and met her sisters in the middle of the hall and said, Why do you stand there? Lift the load off this poor man's head. And together, the keeper before him and the buyer behind, they took the basket down and emptied it. 
and when everything was in its place, flowers to one side, fruit to the other, they gave the porter a coin and said, be on your way. But morning gained on Shahrazad and cut her speaking short. The story goes, she said, that when the porter considered these women, their beauty and wit, their abundance of wine and meat and fruit and scent and sweets, and no man among them, he was amazed. And as he made no movement to go, one of them said, what is it? Have we paid you too little? And to her sister, give him another coin. But the porter said, the wage is more than I deserve, but the way you live concerns me and how it is that you are here alone without a man. As a table must stand on four legs, so you three need a fourth. And as the pleasure of men falls short without women, so it is for women without men. And they laughed at him and said, being women, we have secrets. Why should we reveal them where may they may not be kept? But the porter said, believe me, I am a man of sense and care. I have read books, listened and learned and cited my sources, show what is good and conceal what is bad. And I am well behaved. And they, you know very well what this table has cost us. What have you to offer in return? We cannot let you stay, gaze at our pretty faces and drink our wine for free. To which the keeper added, if you have nothing, leave with nothing. Sisters, said the buyer, let him be. I swear to God he served me well today. Another man would not have been so patient and let me pay his share. At which the porter kissed the ground in thanks. All I have, he said, is this coin, yours, the first I earned today. Take it back and take me, not as a companion, but a slave. Sit, said the women, you are welcome. Then the buyer rose and drew a tighter loop around her waist, tidied up the room and laid the table, strained the wine, arranged the cups and bowls and beakers, the spoons of gold and silver, and when the food and drink was spread at the pool's edge, invited her sisters to sit. The porter among them believed himself in a dream. And at the first and the first cup she filled and drank herself, a second for her sister, a third for the other. Then she poured one for the porter, who sang their praise in verse. Drink, said the buyer, and be well. The wine will bring you health, banish the pain and quicken the cure. And they drank, draining and filling and draining their cups, until the porter, full of wine, fell to singing bawdy songs, began to dance and set upon them with his teeth and fingers, pinching, prodding, and one of them fought back with food, the other with words, the third with flowers, but he was in the fold of pleasure. And they went on like this until the wine played in their heads, and when drink had outdone them, the keeper rose and stepped out of her clothes, loosed her hair and let it screen her, and threw herself naked into the pool. But morning gained on Shahrazad and cut her speaking short. The story goes, she said, that the keeper, surfacing, danced in the spray and dipped her head duckwise, filled her mouth with water and shot it at the porter and washed her breasts and navel and between her thighs. Then she rushed out of the pool into the porter's lap, pointed to her heat and said, my lord, my love, what's this? Your womb, he said, and she said, wow, you have no shame and cuffed him on the neck. Your mound, he said, and one sister shouted ugly word and nipped him. Your cunt, he said, and the other hammered at his chest to cries of shame and knocked him back. Your sting, he said, and the naked woman smacked him and said no. Your dip, he said, your dingle, your disclosure, and she said no, 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 and every word he said won him a slap and the same question, what is this? And this girl hammered, that one pinched, the other prodded him until at last he said, what is its name? Basil of Bridges, she said. Basil of Bridges, you could have told me sooner. Ow! And the cup was passed around. Then the buyer rose, stripped as her sister had done, and threw herself naked into the pool, dipped her head duckwise, and washed her belly and around her breasts and between the thighs. Then she rushed out of the pool into the porter's lap and said, Heart of my heart, what's this? Your mound, he said. And she gave him a blow to shake the room and said, You have no shame. Your womb, he said, and one sister shouted, ugly, with a slap. Your sting, he said, and the other sister cuffed him and said, wah, no shame at all. And they went on like this. One pricked, another swatted, that one elbowed him as he kept trying, cunt, womb, dip, and they said, no, no, no. Basil of Bridges, he cried at last, and all three women laughed until they fell, 
then came down on his neck with blows harder than ever and said, no. What is its name, he said. The sesame seed, we call it. Hallelujah, the sesame seed. Then the girl put on her clothes and they sat back to drink, the porter moaning at the pain in his shoulders and his neck. Then the eldest and most beautiful removed her clothes in turn as the porter rubbed his neck and pleaded, for the love of God, my neck, my shoulders. But the woman dived and disappeared into the pool and the porter's eyes settled on her naked form, which was like a slice of moon and on her face, which was both full moon and yellow dawn, and took in her full length, her breasts and heavy dancing hips, bare as her Lord had made her, and let out a long O, and said these lines, If I compare your figure to the tender green bough, the lie oppresses me, for boughs all robed in leaf are lovelier, but you unrobed are loveliest to see. And the girl at these words rushed out of the pool into the porter's lap, pointed to her heat and said, light of my eyes, my little liver, what is this? Basil of bridges, he said. Bah, sesame seed, he said. Oof, your womb, he said. Yo, so little shame, she said, and came down on his neck. And to make the story short, my king, it went like this. The porter said, its name is so-and-so, and she said, no, no, no. And when he had his fill of bites and blows, when his neck was bruised and swollen, he said, well, what is its name? Hotel Happiness, she said. <laughs> Hotel Happiness. Then she rose and dressed, and they passed the cup between them for a while. And at last the porter stood, took off his clothes, a dangling thing between his thighs, and leapt into the pool. But morning gained on Shahrazad and cut her speaking short. More? <laughs> Would you like some water? <laughs> uh, I'm okay. Yeah, okay. Would be lovely to hear some water. Yeah. The story goes, my king, that when the porter went into the water, he washed himself under the beard and arms. Then he rushed out and fell into the eldest's lap, arms in the arms of the keeper and legs in the hands of the buyer, pointed to his penis and said, ladies, what is this? And the women laughed, happy that his mischief agreed with theirs. Your cock, said one, and he said, ugly, shame. Your penis, said another, have some shame. Your stick, the other ventured, no. Your highness, no. Your thing, your sack, your load. And he said, no, no, no. What is its name, they said. But he came down on one with kisses, one with squeezes, one with nails, and one with teeth. And the girls fell over laughing and said, brother, what is its name? Don't you know, said the porter, it is called the roving mule. What is the meaning of this name? It is the one who grazes on the basil of bridges, eats the sesame seed, and runs wild in hotel happiness. <laughs> and they fell back laughing and carried on drinking until night. And when it was dark, the women said to the porter, it is time to put your slippers on and show us the breadth of your back. To part with my soul, he said, would be easier. Let us join the night today and go our own way in the morning. Sisters, said the buyer, let him stay. We may not live to meet his like again. You can stay, they said, on one condition, that you submit to our command and that no matter what you see, you ask no questions. And he said, yes, yes, yes. Now get up, they said, and read what it says above the door. So he went to the door and found written above it in letters of gold, Speak of what concerns thee not, and burning ears shall be thy lot. And the porter said, I promise. Then the buyer put the feast together, and when they had eaten, they lit the candles and spiked the wax with amber and burned the aloes wood. And when the fruit and wine were served, they sat again to drink, and there they stayed for an hour, drinking and talking and lazing and laughing, when they heard a knock at the door. And the women were not disturbed, but one of them rose to answer and said on her return, Our pleasure tonight will be complete. How so? At the door, she said, are three dervishes, each with a shaven head and face and blind in the right eye, the strangest thing. And by the look of them, they have traveled far to reach Baghdad. Evening gained on them, and being strangers, they have nowhere to sleep and have come to ask the master of the house if he might give them shelter. And each of them, sisters, has a face to make a mourning mother laugh. Why don't we let them in, she said, amuse ourselves tonight and see them off tomorrow. 
and she talked her sisters into it on the condition the men ask no questions. And she disappeared, satisfied, and returned with three beardless, half-blind men who greeted them, bowed low, and stood back. But the women rose to their welcome, gave thanks for their safety, and invited them to sit. And the dervishes bowed again and looked around the room at the table laden with food, the burning candles, smoking incense, fruit and wine, and the women without veils, and said, by God, this is good. <laughs> and when they saw the porter sprawled and spent, sore after the beating he had taken, they said, is he one of us? Arab? Other? A wanderer, no doubt. At which the porter, straightening, glared at them and said, mind your own business. Have you not seen the words above the door? Speak of what concerns thee not, and burning ears shall be thy lot. Yet no sooner are you welcomed in than wagging tongues. And they said, Mercy, our heads are in your hands. And the women laughed, made peace between the men, fed the dervishes and sat around to drink, the keeper filling their cups, until the porter said, Friends, have you no story to tell us? But morning gained on Shahrazad and cut her speaking short. The story goes that the dervishes, warm with wine, called for musical instruments, and the keeper brought them a tambourine, a flute, and a Persian harp, and each man chose an instrument and tuned it, and they began to play, and the women sang with them until they roared, and among their din came a knock at the door, and the keeper went to look. Now the reason for that knock, my king, was this. On that very night, the caliph Harun al-Rashid had gone into the city with Ja'far, his vizier, as was their custom, and happened to pass the house and caught the strains of music and the women's laughter. And the caliph said, Ja'far, I want to meet the people in this house. Commander of believers, said Ja'far, these are people drink has taken over. They don't know who we are, and I fear we may find trouble at their hands. That's it.